Access your free language gifts right now, before they expire. First, the Shopping at a Mall Conversation PDF Cheat Sheet. You'll learn all the must-know words and phrases for shopping and getting around the mall with this new cheat sheet. Download it for free right now. Second, the top 15 phrases for exchanges, refunds, and complaints. This one-minute lesson will teach you phrases like, I got the wrong size, can I get a refund, and much more. Third, how about online shopping phrases? With this quick lesson, you'll learn how to say, sign up, log in, add to cart, and much more in your target language. Access it right now. Fourth, want to know how to improve your speaking skills? This one minute lesson reveals all the top learning strategies that will get you speaking with confidence. Fifth, the Mother's Day and Father's Day writing worksheet. This bonus printable PDF worksheet teaches you the must-know vocabulary for Mother's Day and Father's Day. And you can even practice writing the words out. And sixth, free language learning audiobooks for anyone who's watched this far. If you visit the link below, we'll send you over to our library of language learning audiobooks, which you can get for free. Save them to your device and listen and learn. They're yours to keep forever. To get your gifts and language learning resources, click the link in the description below. Download them right now before they expire. In this video, you'll learn 10 of the most common words and phrases in English. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. Welcome to the 2000 Core English Words and Phrases video series. This series will teach you the 2000 most common words and phrases in English. Each lesson will help you practice and review what you've learned. Okay, let's get started. First is insignificant. 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 So the word insignificant means something that is not important. It's not special. If we break this word down, we have the prefix in, which means not or no, and the word significant, which means something that is important or something that we need to care about or pay attention to a lot. So together, this means not significant or not important or not something that we need to care or think about a lot. Insignificant. Insignificant amount. Insignificant amount. Insignificant amount. Famous. 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 So something that is famous is something or someone that is very, very well known. So this is usually someone like a celebrity, like an actor or an actress. Maybe they're a musician, they're part of a band, perhaps they're an artist, they create paintings, or maybe they write something that's very, very well known. So someone who is famous is known by many different people, and something that is famous is also known by many different people. For example, famous actor. Famous actor. Famous actor. Sneeze. 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 So sneeze is a verb and a noun. To sneeze, the verb, means that feeling that you have in your nose when your body needs to move air out of it really quickly. We have that achoo, right? That's called the noun form sneeze. And as a verb, we say to sneeze. So that means to do that action. For example, the woman is sneezing. The woman is sneezing. The woman is sneezing. Casual. 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 So casual is the opposite of formal. Casual means something that is kind of relaxed, something that is laid back, something that's not super polite. So when we have everyday conversations with our friends, we usually use casual language or we dress in casual clothes or we have kind of a casual feeling. For example, casual clothing. Casual clothing. Casual clothing. Guitar. 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 This word has kind of an interesting spelling. It starts with G-U-I, but we pronounce this as gi. So a guitar is a musical instrument. We play it like this usually, and this is something that is played all over the world. There are lots and lots of talented people who play guitar, and they are called guitarists. For example, some of them play a six-string guitar. Six-string guitar. Six-string guitar. 
Next is breathe. 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 Okay, this word is a verb. It means to take air into your body and to put air out of your body. This process of getting air into your body and moving it out is called breathing. Make sure you're cautious of the spelling of this. To breathe, this word has an E at the end, yeah? We also have a noun that looks very similar and is related to this process. That's called breath, but there's no E at the end. So be careful when you use this as a verb. Make sure you don't forget that E. For example, breathe deeply, breathe deeply, breathe deeply, spit, spit, spit. So this is kind of a gross vocabulary word, but it's important to know. This is a noun and a verb. So as a verb, to spit means to force whatever is in your mouth out of your mouth. So if you're eating something, for example, and you spit it out, that means you force it out of your mouth. If you have nothing in your mouth, just the water, the liquid in your mouth, and you put that out of your mouth, that's called spitting. So to spit means to force something out of your mouth. As a noun, spit means just the liquid inside your mouth. So an example, no spitting, no spitting, no spitting. Dentist, dentist, dentist. So the dentist is the tooth doctor. So when you need to have your teeth cleaned, when you need to talk to a doctor about something happening in your mouth, with your teeth, with your gums, these kinds of things, you visit a dentist. It's important to see a dentist regularly. So for example, see a dentist. See a dentist. See a dentist. Cavity. 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 So a cavity usually refers to a hole in your tooth. So this is a very common type of tooth damage. When you have a cavity, you need to go and see a dentist to get it repaired. For example, deep cavity, deep cavity, deep cavity, asthma, asthma, asthma. So this word has very interesting spelling. There's a TH in the middle, but we don't say asthma, we say asthma. So kind of ignore that, but try to remember it when you're spelling this word. So asthma is a very, very common type of illness that affects the lungs. So someone who has asthma may have trouble breathing normally, or maybe they are irritated, their lungs get irritated by some kind of allergic reaction, or maybe they have to take some kind of medication to help them to breathe regularly. So different people have different kinds of asthma, but this is a very common illness that affects the lungs. So here's an example expression. Asthma inhaler. Asthma inhaler. Asthma inhaler. Let's review. I'm going to describe a word or phrase in English. See if you can remember it. Then repeat after me, focusing on pronunciation. Ready? Do you remember how to say the word that means something that is not big, something that is not important, something that is not significant? Insignificant. Insignificant. Next, do you remember how to describe someone or something that many, many people know about? Lots of people around the country, around the city, around the world. Famous. Famous. What about the word we use to describe when we quickly let air out of our nose, like when we have an allergic reaction or when we feel sick? What word means to quickly expel air from the nose? Sneeze. Sneeze. Do you remember how to say the word that's the opposite of formal. It's the word we use to talk about our relationships with our friends and family and other people we are close to. Casual. Casual. Okay, 
Let's try the name of the instrument that has strings that you play by making this motion. Guitar. Guitar. What about the word we use to talk about taking air into our body and releasing air from our body? What's the word we use to describe this action? Breathe. Breathe. Now, let's see if you remember how to talk about removing the water that's in your mouth very, very quickly. This is often kind of a rude thing to do. Spit. Spit. Okay, another one. What's the word that we use to explain the doctor that we go to for our teeth? Dentist. Dentist. Do you remember the word to talk about a hole in our tooth? This is a major medical issue. Cavity. Cavity. And finally, do you remember how to say the medical condition that affects your lungs and makes it hard to breathe? Asthma. Asthma. Well done! In this lesson, you expanded your vocabulary and learned 10 new useful words. See you next time. Bye! Hi everybody, welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe. Let's get to your first question this week. First question this week comes from Emblem Newtonian. Hi Emblem. Emblem says, hey Alicia, what is the difference between mean, means, and meant? Like, what do you mean? You are so mean. It's meant to be it means, and so on. Yeah, great question. Okay, let's break this answer down into two groups. We'll talk about the adjective mean, and we'll also talk about the verb use of mean, which will answer your question about mean, means, and meant. So first, let's talk about the adjective of mean. So the adjective mean has the meaning not nice. So someone who is not nice is someone who is mean. This is the adjective use. So in your example, you're so mean, or he's being mean, or she's really mean. These are all adjective uses of the word mean. So this is specifically an adjective. These uses are all adjective uses. Okay, so now let's talk about the uses of this word as a verb. When we use mean as a verb, it does not mean to not be nice or something like that. Mean as a verb refers to the definition of something or refers to the purpose of something. So for example, in a question like, what do you mean? Which we use a lot to ask for clarification, right? We're really saying, what is your purpose? Or what is the intended like definition? What is the intended information here. What do you mean? So this use of mean is not the same as the adjective, which means to not be nice. This use refers to the definition of something or the purpose of something. We can look at some more examples of this, like I meant this in my earlier statement, or that's not what I meant means that's not what I wanted to say, or that's not what I was trying to express. So meant is the past tense of mean. We can use it in this way to talk about our past intended purpose, right? So that's not what I meant means that's not what I was trying to say. That's not what I was trying to express. When we use it in the present tense, we have this same feeling too, like, oh, don't worry about him. He means well. So that means he he intends to express things in a positive way, or he intends to describe himself positively. That's what the expression he means well or she means well means. <laughs> so it's hard not to talk about this word without using 
mean as well. So keep in mind then that the verb use of this word is very different from the adjective use. You might think, okay, well, how do I know which one is which? The key is to look at the grammar of the sentence. Earlier we talked about sentences like he is really mean or she was really mean to me or you're so mean, right? We have the be verb preceding the word there. He was mean. She is mean. You are mean, right? That's a really good hint that that's probably the adjective use. On the other hand, when you see the verb use of this word, we see it in sentences like what do you mean? Or she meant this and this and this in the meeting. Or that's not what I meant, right? We don't see that be verb used here. So that's a pretty good hint uh, that you can use to distinguish, to be able to understand the difference between the verb form and the adjective form of mean. Great, so I hope that this answer helped you understand the differences between the verb and the adjective forms of mean. Also, one more comment from me that I want you all to keep in mind, hopefully, is that when you want to ask a question about the meaning of a word, you can use the mean verb form to do that, but be careful of the form that you choose. In some of your comments, I often see an expression like, what does subject means? Or what does this thing means? The S at the end of that is incorrect. Make sure you say, what does thing mean? Or what does word mean? Don't put an S at the end of that. So please keep that question in mind for use in your language lessons. It's a really important question to know. All right, thanks very much for sending this question along. Let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Mosen. Hi, Mosen. Mosen says, what's the difference between wine and alcoholic beverages? Okay, sure, let's talk about this question. So the short answer here is that wine is a type of alcoholic beverages. Let's break down what this means. So alcoholic beverages, this is a category of drink. An alcoholic beverage is a beverage or a drink that has alcohol in it. So beverage is a very formal word for drink. We use the expression beverage on like a menu or maybe on a contract, maybe on a shipping document if you're sending and receiving lots of drinks for your company, for example. So we don't really use the word alcoholic beverages in everyday conversation, but you might see it if you are at a restaurant, for example, there might be a category on the menu that says alcoholic beverages or alcoholic drinks. So alcoholic beverages refers to all drinks that have alcohol in them. Wine is an example of an alcoholic beverage. So wine is one type of alcoholic beverage. There are many other types of alcoholic beverages. We could have beer, for example, or maybe we have cocktails as well. Maybe there's shots where you are. So there are lots and lots of different types of drinks. Maybe some that I haven't even heard of. Maybe you have a special type of alcoholic beverage in your culture. But basically, alcoholic beverage is the category name and wine is an example of of an alcoholic beverage. So you might see alcoholic beverages on a menu and that's what this refers to, drinks that have alcohol in them. Keep in mind too that we tend not to use beverages in everyday conversation. More commonly you'll hear people say drinks and sometimes when people are talking about going out for alcoholic beverages they will say, do you want to get a drink? So although they don't say alcoholic drink, typically we assume that it means an alcoholic drink. Let's go get a drink often means let's go get an alcoholic drink. All right, so I hope that this helps answer your question. Alcoholic beverages is the category and wine is one item within that category. Thanks very much for sending your question along. Okay, let's move on to our next question. Next question comes from Long. Hi, Long. Long says, Alicia, can you help me distinguish between these sentences? One, the shop is closed. Two, the shop closes. Three, the shop is open. And four, the shop is opened. Okay, so I think that maybe the confusion that comes with questions like these and sentences like these is because in certain contexts, in certain sentences, parts of these are correct. So first, let's look at the shop is open and the shop is closed, these two sentences. These are used when a shop is open for business, so the shop is currently doing business, and when the shop is not doing business, so open and closed. These are the sentences that we use to describe the opening hours of a shop. So we're talking about the status, the state of the shop. So if I am working right now, I would say the shop is open. So not open, that would be incorrect. If I am not working, I finished, I've locked the store for the day, I would say the shop is closed. <laughs> 
So these are the only two ways that we can express this status. We cannot say the shop is opened or the shop is closed, okay? Or the shop closes as well. We cannot use these to express a status. Let's talk now about those other two example sentences you introduced. The shop closes and the shop is opened. First, let's talk about the shop closes. The shop closes is the beginning of a sentence describing the closing time of a shop. So the shop closes at 8 p.m. is a full sentence, but the shop closes alone makes no sense. We don't know. We have to have some more information. The shop closes at 12 o'clock. The shop closes at 12.30, whatever. We use that expression, the beginning of that, to begin the sentence that describes the closing time of the business. The shop closes at time, okay? One more use that you might see is not with a specific time, but with the word soon. So the shop closes soon might also be used to talk about the closing time of a shop. So let's talk now, lastly, about the last example sentence you included. The shop is opened. This is a grammatically incorrect pattern. We don't use this pattern to talk about opening times or anything like that. If you want to use open to begin a sentence talking about the opening time of a shop, you can use the shop opens at 8 o'clock. The shop opens at 10 o'clock. Opens. We cannot use open in this way. The shop open at 8 is incorrect. The shop open at 9 also incorrect. The shop opens at 9. So I know that this little s is really confusing sometimes and it's hard to remember. So I would suggest you just try to practice these as set phrases. The shop opens at time. The shop closes at time. The shop is open. The shop is closed. These are the only sentences that we use to talk about the open and close times of shops and stores and so on. So I hope that this breakdown helped you understand which sentences are correct, which sentences are partially correct and need a little more information in which you definitely should not use in the future. So I hope this helps you understand the differences between open, closed, and the other uses of these words. Thanks very much for sending this question along. All right, that is everything that I have for this week. Thank you, as always, for sending your questions. Thanks very much for watching this week's episode of Ask Alicia, and I will see you again next time. Bye! Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe. Let's get to your first question this week. First question this week comes from Mosen. Hi, Mosen. Mosen says, what does got so far mean? Okay, sure. Let's talk about got so far. So maybe you've heard this expression in a really popular song lyric, which is I tried so hard and got so far. Or maybe you've heard this used maybe when you're playing a video game or something. After you die in the game, you might hear someone say, Oh, I got so far. So what does this mean? So this expression, got so far, means I achieved a lot, or I was able to accomplish many things, or I proceeded far in the story. I proceeded a long way in the story. But this expression uses got in past tense, right? And I also used past tense in my breakdown of this, right? I achieved a lot, or I moved forward a lot in the story. So the feeling with this expression, like, oh, I tried so hard and got so far, or I got so far in the game. It's like saying, I went the distance. I went a long way, but then something happened. <laughs> so my progress was ruined or I wasn't able to continue. Like in a video game, oh, I died in the game, so I had to go back to the beginning. So in the video game example, if you've been playing for like 30 minutes or an hour and you continue the story for a while and then you die, you might think, ah, oh, I got so far. This sounds like I'm kind of sad. <laughs> so I was doing really, really well, but now here I am back at the zero point, at the start point again. So when we use it in expressions like the popular song lyric I mentioned, I tried so hard and got so far, it's also like saying, I was working really hard on something. I was really doing well, but then something happened and now I'm back at the start. So this is kind of an expression that we use to express those feelings of like uh, sadness and loss and like, oh man, maybe embarrassment sometimes or just kind of depression. I have to start all over again is what this expression often communicates. Dang, I got so far. It's like saying, 
I was doing really well, but now I'm back at the start. So this is what the expression got so far is generally used to mean. So I hope that those two examples help you understand how you can use it as well. Okay, thanks very much for the question. Let's move on to our next one. Next one comes from Eddie. Hi, Eddie. Eddie says, what's the difference between wear and dress? Nice question. Yeah, let's talk about these as verbs. I'm going to talk about this answer with wear and dress used as verbs. And I also want to point out there are some uses of wear as a verb that I'm not going to talk about for this video. I'm going to talk about the uses of wear that are related to clothing and etc. So let's begin this breakdown by focusing on wear. So let's talk about the uses of the verb wear that relate to clothing. So the two uses I want to talk about today are one, the use that means to have something on your body. This is what we use to talk about clothes, to talk about makeup, to talk about accessories and so on. And the second use we'll cover today is the use of wear to mean to habitually have something on. This is what we use to describe like our sizes, uh, to talk about maybe a specific color that we often put on our body and so on. So let's talk about that first use of wear, which means to have something on the body. So we could use it in a sentence like, I usually wear a black shirt for this series, or he's not wearing glasses today, or she wears really cool makeup. So we can use wear in this way to mean to have something on the body. We usually use it, as I said, to describe our clothing, the things that we have on our person, on our body for the day. We can also use it, as I mentioned, in the second way to talk about like our sizes, the things that we usually or we regularly put on our body. So this second use of wear is used to talk about the things that we regularly or habitually put on our body. So we use this use to talk about our sizes or our preferred colors and so on. So some examples of this are sentences like, he usually wears a medium or she wears a lot of blue. So these are examples of how we express our sizes, our regular size of clothing and the preferred colors. We could also use it in the negative, like she doesn't wear a lot of green and so on. So these verb uses of wear are the ones that we use to talk about the things we put on our body and to talk about clothes, accessories, and so on. So let's compare this to the verb to dress. Yes, there is a noun dress, which is a type of clothing that goes over the body, but we're not going to talk about the noun dress. Today, I want to focus on the verb to dress. So to dress means to put on the clothing and accessories that you are going to wear for the day, to dress. So this is not used so much in everyday conversation these days. It feels a little bit old fashioned. Generally, when we talk about preparing ourselves for the day, we use the expression, get ready. Like I'm going to get ready for the day. Or if we want to talk about our clothes specifically, we say, I'm going to put on my clothes for the day. So this verb use of dress is pretty old fashioned. We don't use it so much. Instead, we tend to use put on clothes. So let's take a look at some example sentences so you can see the differences. First, my son dressed himself this morning and my son put on his clothes himself this morning. So both of these sentences mean the same thing and they're 100% correct. They both mean that the son, in this case, maybe a very young child who is learning to put on his clothes was able to do it by himself. They both express the same idea, but the one that uses the verb dress sounds a little bit more formal, a little bit more old fashioned. The second example sentence sounds a little bit more natural for everyday communication these days. My son put on his clothes himself self this morning. So to dress means to put on all of your things for the day. But you might see this word in maybe old stories. So you might also see it, I suppose, in more formal kinds of writing. It's a little bit up to the writer in this case, because it's definitely not wrong to use dress in this manner. It's just that we kind of tend to use put on more in everyday situations. Another comment that I want to add to answer this question is that we also have the expression get dressed and we use this a lot as a command or as a request. So you might say to somebody like your roommate or your partner like, ah, get dressed, hurry up and get dressed, we're gonna be late. So get 
dressed is a set phrase. We say get dressed, which means usually hurry up and put your clothes on your body or get ready, get everything ready, get dressed. So that implies, that makes it sound like the person is not wearing clothes and they're not wearing clothes that are appropriate to leave the house in. So you might hear this command used as well or this request used. You can use it usually in your house. I suppose there are probably very few situations outside the house where you need to ask someone to get dressed, I hope. But you might also hear this expression used. So this means please prepare. Please put your clothes on. Please put whatever you need on your body so that we can go somewhere else. So you might hear get dressed in this way. But generally when we use just the verb dress without that get in front of it, it tends to sound a little bit more old fashioned. So I hope this answers your question about the differences between to wear and to dress as verbs. As I said, there are many other uses of the verb to wear. I won't cover them in today's lesson because they're very different, but you can check out a dictionary if you want to know more. All right, thanks very much for sending this question along. Let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Adam. Hi, Adam. Adam says, what's the difference between minimum and minimal? Okay, let's break this down. So, Minimum. The minimum of something means the least of something, the least possible in some cases, or the least that is required in some cases. So for example, the minimum score required to pass the test is 85%. Or the minimum amount of time we need to finish this project is 30 days. So this is describing like the least possible or kind of giving the base requirement. We're starting from this point and if you get more than this, great that's fine. Or if you have more time than this, that's fine. But the minimum of something kind of expresses the base or the ground or the floor, or the start point for some kind of range for something like that. The opposite of the minimum is the maximum of something. So as high as you can go. So when we're talking about the minimum of something, we often use it when we're describing requirements. So as I talked about with a test or maybe with a project schedule, something like that. So when we describe the minimum of something, that means like we need at least this this much of something. This is the start point. And more than that is great, but this is the like the least part or the least amount that we can accept. On the other hand, minimal is an adjective that is typically these days used to describe kind of a style or an aesthetic or a way of living. Something that is minimal has only the things that are needed inside it, maybe not even that. So you might imagine, for example, something like a minimal apartment. A minimal apartment style would have maybe nothing inside it except maybe a table and a chair, or maybe there's just a few things that the person needs inside the apartment. Maybe even their clothing is very minimal. They don't have a lot of decorations. They don't have a lot of, I don't know, personal expression in it, whatever. Something that is very minimal is reduced to just what is necessary. So this is the opposite of a maximal style. So a maximal style has lots of stuff in it. It's very flashy and colorful and there's tons and tons and tons of things inside it. So when we have a maximal apartment, if you can imagine that, it's full of stuff maybe. So we typically don't use maximal to describe apartments. You might see people using maximal to describe certain kinds of art styles, but minimal on the other hand is used a lot to describe fashion and apartments and spaces these days. Something that is very minimal is something that has only the basic things inside it. So I hope this helps you understand the differences between minimum and minimal. Thanks very much for sending this question along. All right, great. That is everything that I have for this week. Thank you, as always, for sending your great question. Thanks very much for watching this week's episode of Ask Alicia, and I will see you again next time. Bye! Hey everybody, welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe. Let's get to your first question this week. This week's first question comes from DJ Ibril Jibril. I'm not sure if I said that correctly. Hi. Uh, Jibril says, dodge a bullet. When and how can we use this phrase? Yeah, great question. It's a really interesting expression. First, let's break down what this means, and then we'll talk about the situations in which you can use this expression. So first, to dodge a bullet. Let's break this down. First, the verb is dodge. To dodge something means to get out of the way of something that's moving very quickly. So if someone 
throws a ball at you and you move quickly out of the way, you can say you dodged the ball. Right? There's a whole game called dodgeball <laughs> that's built around this idea. So to dodge something means to get out of the way of something moving quickly, something that's probably dangerous. And a bullet is the small piece of metal that comes from a gun. So when we shoot a gun, the thing that comes out of the gun is called the bullet. So when we say you dodged a bullet, it sounds like you moved very fast and you got out of the way of a very very dangerous thing or a very bad thing that was coming at you very quickly. So this means this expression means you escaped from a bad situation or you escaped from a dangerous situation. So we use this in situations in which something bad was going to happen probably in the future, but you got out of it. So we can use this expression to talk about relationships, like maybe you meet somebody that's dangerous or that seems strange, or maybe that's not good for you in the future, or maybe it's about a job where the situation at the job is just not going well, and you get out of that situation. So we use this expression to dodge a bullet to mean you got out of something before it became worse. So here are some examples. Oh, I'm so glad you stopped dating that guy. He seemed really, really strange. I think you dodged a bullet. And oh my gosh, I'm so glad I left my company last year. They just declared bankruptcy. I really dodged a bullet. So in each of these situations, the person in the situation just got out of something before it became worse. So we use this a lot for interpersonal relationships. We use it a lot for kind of everyday life situations where we think that things might not get so good. So to dodge a bullet means to escape from something bad. And we always say dodge a bullet. We don't really say like dodge a ball or. Or dodge something else. We always use this expression to dodge a bullet. So I hope this helped your understanding of this interesting phrase. Thanks for sending this along. Okay, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Tan. Hi, Tan. Tan says, "Hi, Alicia. Can you help me distinguish between volunteer and voluntary, like volunteer activities and voluntary activities, and charity and charitable, like charity work and charitable work?" Thank you so much. Sure. Yeah. Let's start by looking at volunteer and voluntary. Let's start with that word voluntary. So something that is voluntary. This is an adjective. Means it's something that you choose to do. You have the option to do that thing or to not do that thing. So, for example, filling out this questionnaire is voluntary. That means you don't have to do it. You have the option. Of filling out the questionnaire, you can choose to do it. You can choose not to do it. There's no penalty if you don't do it. So this is a very common one. So filling out this questionnaire is voluntary, or this questionnaire is voluntary. That's something that you can choose to do. So volunteer, on the other hand, especially in the example that you gave, volunteer work refers specifically to choosing to use your time and not get paid for your time to go and do work, usually for a community organization. A community group or some other kind of like nonprofit organization. It's often to do some kind of like community building or community contribution sort of thing. So volunteer typically is used in these cases where we have this idea of using our time and using our effort for free in order to contribute to some kind of community thing. And voluntary refers to something that you have an option to do or not. Do so. We tend to use voluntary more in kind of formal or official situations. Like participation is voluntary. That means that it's up to you. Is another fancy. It's kind of like a fancy way of saying it's up to you to do this thing. You might also hear people kind of using words like optional as well to describe these sorts of things. Like participation is optional, meaning you have the option. Not to do it. <laughs> so you might hear voluntary and optional used in these kinds of ways, but we typically use volunteer work or volunteer activities to talk about those kinds of community building efforts. So I hope that this kind of helps you understand the difference between something that is voluntary, you have the option to do or not do, and volunteer, which refers to kind of charitable things. This relates to your second question. You were talking about charitable and charity. So we typically use charity. To refer to a group 
that or an organization that collects money or does some kind of volunteer activities for the community. So the name of these kinds of groups, the category, these are called charities. So when you say something like charity work, that typically means volunteer work for a charity. Charitable, on the other hand, is a word that we use to describe these activities. So she did some very charitable work in her community, which means that she did work probably for free for a charity organization for her community. So charity and charitable are very closely related. They both refer to doing things usually for free or perhaps donating money as well, giving money or giving resources, time, and so on to a community group. So the word charitable, this adjective in a sentence like she is a very charitable person or they do a lot of charitable activities refers to someone who uses their time and their money and their generosity to contribute to something in their community. And a charity refers to the organization or the group that usually kind of organizes these types of activities. So charity work refers to work for a charity and charitable relates to those kinds of activities. So that's describing those people or those kinds of activities. So all of these I think are closely related. You could say, for example, I volunteer at a charity or she does lots of volunteer work. She's a very charitable person. So these kinds of words can often be used in kind of similar situations to describe the activities of people. But I hope that this helps you kind of understand the differences between the two. To recap, to volunteer for something means to participate in an organization, usually a local community organization, for no money. Voluntary means something you can do with an option not to do it. You can choose whether or not to do that thing. A charity is an organization or a community group that collects money and other resources to make contributions to the community. And charitable refers to someone or something that does lots of good like volunteer or donation related efforts to help their community. So I hope that this answer helps you understand the differences between these words. Thanks very much for sending this question along. Okay, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Shinsuke. Hi Shinsuke. Shinsuke says, hi Alicia, it's apostrophe S is short for it is, right? Then what do we say for the short version of it was? Well, we don't really have a short version of it was in modern day English. In old English, we have twas, but we really don't say that very much these days. It sounds extremely old fashioned to say twas, but you might hear this from time to time in like movies and TV shows that are set in maybe older times. So you might hear twas and that's what it means. It was. But in today's English, we don't say it was. We just say it really fast and it kind of sounds like a shortened version. So for example, instead of saying it was a really fun night, we might say it was a really fun night. So the T kind of gets really, really soft and really short there. So not it was a fun night, but it was, it was, it was. The T kind of disappears there in American English anyway. It was a really fun night or it was great seeing you. These kinds of expressions just become much, much faster and shorter and we don't pronounce the T very clearly. So it is, yes, can be used to mean it is. It can also be used to refer to the possessive form of it, but we don't have a reduced form of it was unless you go into way, way, way back in history and find twas, which doesn't get used very much these days. But I hope that this answers your question. Thanks very much for sending it along. All right, that is everything that I have for this week's lesson. Thank you, as always, for sending your great questions. Thanks very much for watching this week's episode of Ask Alicia, and I will see you again next time. Bye. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe. Let's get to your first question this week. First question comes from Mina. Hi, Mina. Mina says, What's the difference between try and attempt? It seems like I can use them in the same way, but I'm not sure. Nice question. Yeah, try and attempt. We're going to look at these as verbs in this answer. First, let's take a look at the word try. So to try something means to usually do something for the first time. Often we want to mimic the way someone else does something. That means we want to do something in about the same way as someone else does something or we decide to test something, like testing food for the first time. Here are some example sentences. Hey, try swinging the tennis racket like this. 
And then you, there's usually a demonstration. So we're trying to mimic the other person. Or, oh, you should try this restaurant. It's so good. So in both of these example sentences, we're asking the other person to do their best, like to mimic something or to do something in the same manner as something or someone else. Or we're asking someone to do something for the first time, usually as a recommendation, like try this restaurant or try this food, or you've got to try this and so on. So try usually refers to mimicking something something, like doing something in the same way as someone else, or doing something for the first time, usually as a recommendation. Let's compare this to attempt. So again, I want to compare these two as verbs. To attempt something means to try something. Yes, this is where the confusion comes in. But to attempt something means that you are going to do your best to do an action. So in my first example sentence with try, I talked about using a tennis racket. It, right? My example sentence was try swinging the tennis racket like this. We can use attempt in the same way, but it tends to sound one more formal, and we also tend to use this a little bit more in like polite conversations. So, for example, it would sound kind of unnatural to say attempt to swing the tennis racket in this way. Try sounds more like do as I do. Maybe you can do it in the same way as I do. Attempt sounds much more like official, more formal, like they're going to maybe break a world record if they do this successfully, or they're going to do something that's really special in some way. So some examples with attempt might sound like this. We're going to attempt to send a rocket to the moon. Or we attempted to break the sales record last year. So these uses of attempt are in kind of more formal situations. They're kind of more serious situations. And it's less about just testing something out for the first time. It's more about using a lot of effort in order to achieve something. So there's some kind of goal and you want to achieve that goal. With try, on the other hand, it's more like just do it once, <laughs> see how it goes. Make an effort to do something. If you fail, it's not a big problem. On the other hand, with attempt, it sounds more like there's something on the line, something serious is going to happen. So that's kind of the main idea that I want to communicate when comparing these two as verbs, try and attempt. But I do want to also add that attempt can also be used as a noun, and it is sometimes used in this way in exactly the same way that we use it as a verb. So for example, they made a great attempt to send a rocket into space, or they made an excellent attempt to break the sales record. So we can also use attempt as a noun, but it has kind of the same feeling of being kind of official, more serious, like there's lots of effort and planning and time that goes into something. With try, it's much more casual, it's much more like a recommendation or like you're just kind of giving something a shot for the first time. So I hope this helps you understand the differences between try and attempt. Thanks very much for sending this question along. Okay, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Jibril, DJ Ibril, I'm not sure how to say your name. Hi. Uh, Jibril says, what does pillow talk mean? For example, people actually pillow talk or I don't do pillow talk. Nice question. Yeah. Pillow talk is kind of a cute phrase. So imagine in this situation when you're using pillow talk that you are laying your head on a pillow and talking to someone. That's the idea with pillow talk. So pillow talk is usually used in romantic situations. Like you are sitting in your bed or you're laying in your bed with someone that you are very close to romantically and you're talking about something. You're having a cute conversation or a romantic conversation and saying nice things to each other. This is sometimes referred to as pillow talk. So this is because you are laying on a pillow and talking to each other. So this is kind of a cute way to talk about these types of conversations. So here are a couple of super quick examples of pillow talk in a sentence. No more pillow talk. Let's go to sleep. Or, ah, we had a good time and the pillow talk was really, really fun. There was some pillow talk in the morning and then we went to breakfast. So that's the idea with pillow talk. It's a conversation that you have with someone you're very close to while you're laying in bed. This expression does have kind of a little bit of an old fashioned feel. I feel that it's not so much used today. I mean, you might hear people using it from time to time and I think it's probably used in movies as well. But pillow talk, that phrase refers to having a very close and intimate conversation with someone while in bed at the same time. 
So I hope that this helps answer your question. Okay, great. Let's move on to the next question. Next question comes from Miran. Hi, Miran. Miran says, "What is the difference between it sounds and it seems?" Nice question. We've talked about similar themes a couple of times here and there. Let's break this down. So, it sounds versus it seems. We use these to make a guess about something. So, a key hint here with it sounds is the ear. Yeah. So, we are getting information in our ear. Based on that information, we make a guess about something. So, for example, if your friend is talking about this new apartment, they love this new apartment, they want to rent it or buy it or something, you might say, "Wow, that sounds good." Or if someone is telling you about an amazing dish they had at a restaurant, you might say, "Wow, that sounds like a great time." So, in both of these situations, it's information you are getting with your ears. So we say it sounds good. You can also use this in negative situations, like for example, if you're sitting in a restaurant and you hear a fight happening outside, you might say, "Oh, that sounds like a fight," or "Whoa, it sounds like something is happening out there." Again, you're using your ears to get information, right? So you can use it. Sounds to express your guess based on that information you got with your ears. On the other hand, seems it seems is a little bit more flexible. So you might use it seems when you just kind of generally have a feeling about some person. So, for example, if your coworker is really upset one day and they're not talking to you very much, and you notice this a little bit, you might say,、mm, "He seems really upset. Is he okay?" So you're not really using just your eyes. Or just your ears, or anything like that. But you want to express some kind of guess you get based on the situation generally. Like,、mm, he seems upset. Is he okay? Or, for example, if you go to an, again a restaurant and maybe the prices are a little bit higher than you expect, you might say, "This seems expensive. I'm not sure. Does this seem normal to you?" So, seem is much more flexible. It's used kind of more generally. We didn't get information with just our eyes or just our ears. It's more like a feeling. We're Expressing kind of this guess based on a feeling, so that's what we use it seems and it sounds to do. I've already talked in this series a little bit about the expression it looks, and as you might be able to guess, we use it looks for information we get with our eyes. So you might use all of these in conversation. It looks, it sounds, and it seems. We use all of them to make guesses and to express those guesses based on the information that we receive. So I hope that this helps answer your question. Thanks very much for sending it along. Okay. That is everything that I have for this week. Thank you, as always, for sending your great questions. Thanks very much for watching this week's episode of Ask Alicia, and I will see you again next time. Bye. Hi, everybody. My name is Alicia. In this lesson, I'm going to talk about some expressions you can use when talking about challenges and struggles. Let's get started. Okay. On this side of the board, I have some expressions that you can use to talk about things that are difficult for you, things that are challenging, or things that cause you to struggle. These are some very common expressions to do that. First, noun phrase is really difficult for me. Noun phrase is really difficult for me. Here, really is in parentheses. You can remove this. So, noun phrase is difficult for me. So. You can put one of these items here if you like. For example, English is really difficult for me, or Spanish is really difficult for me, or maybe exercising is really difficult for me. Eating healthy is really difficult for me. Whatever you find challenging, it's tough, it's hard to do. You can say that thing. So noun phrase is difficult for me. Please, please, please use for here, not to, not. To. English is really difficult for me. Eating healthy is really difficult for me. Also, as I said, I have put difficult here. You can change this to tough. Sounds more casual. You can also use hard, which is probably、uh, the standard way we use difficult. So difficult tends to sound a little bit more polite. I thought this expression would be good if you want to use this at work. If you want to use this with your friends, you can use hard. If you want to sound very casual, you can use tough. So English is really tough for me, or English is really hard for me. English is really difficult for me. Those are the levels, the formality there. Okay, the next one is a very general expression for when you're not sure, you have no confidence or very little confidence. I'm not sure I can do this. I'm not sure I can do this. 
And this is I am not sure. It means 100%. I'm not sure. I can do this. So that means I don't think I can do this or I don't have much confidence. So maybe you're in a very challenging situation like jumping out of a plane to skydive or maybe you have to give a speech in another language. You might think to yourself, I'm not sure I can do this. So this expression gives a sense of like anxiety. So we're very nervous about something. We're not maybe feeling confident in ourselves. So. You might say this just before something you need to do, just before something important, or maybe you're preparing for that thing. And you make a comment to your friend or to your colleague and you say, I'm not sure I can do this. And then your colleague or your friend maybe can cheer you up or try to build your confidence a little bit. So I'm not sure I can do this. This expresses anxiety, so nervousness. Okay, the next expression is I'm struggling with noun phrase. I'm struggling with noun phrase. This is quite similar to the first one from this lesson. Grammatically, it's a little bit different. So I am struggling, struggling. So and in fast speech, it sounds like struggling, struggling, but struggling, <laughs> struggling, we don't say in fast speech, it sounds like struggling. I'm struggling with noun phrase. So this is in the progressive form paired with this I am. So that means this is happening now. I'm struggling with present perfect tense or I'm struggling with work. So this means something is happening now and it's very difficult for me. So this sentence sounds quite general, like English is difficult for me or exercising is difficult for me. Something that I'm not good at doing or it's hard, uh, I don't feel very good at it. This one in the progressive tense sounds like something now. So this is the situation maybe at work recently, the last few weeks or so. I'm struggling now with work or I'm struggling with present perfect tense. Like I'm, we've been studying this in my English lesson and I can't get it. Ah, I'm struggling with present perfect tense. So it sounds like this is kind of a temporary problem, temporary challenge, temporary struggle, but it's like just the thing that's happening right now. So it doesn't mean forever. This sounds like something that's longer term. This sounds like something happening now. Also, the difference between challenge and struggle, challenge generally has kind of a positive feel about it. So a challenge is a good thing. Like you want to challenge yourself. Struggle sounds like it's negative. Ah, oh, this is a struggle. Ah, oh, this is really hard for me. Okay. Let's go to the next one. I don't understand noun phrase. I don't understand noun phrase. This is excellent to use in any lesson that you ever take, not just in an English lesson, not a language lesson, but you can use this in any lesson ever. I don't understand noun phrase. I don't understand this word. I don't understand this grammar. Or if you go to another class, like a painting class or something, you could say, uh, I don't understand this idea, whatever. You can also change this to past tense, I didn't understand something. So like, I didn't understand what he said, or I didn't understand our homework. So you can change this to past tense to talk about something that was difficult to understand in the past. This means right now, I don't understand this word right here. I don't understand this grammar. So if you want to talk about some past point that was confusing for you, you can use, I didn't understand the homework or I didn't understand the lecture. So please keep this point in mind, past tense and present tense. Okay, uh, this next one expresses a lot of anxiety and nervousness. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. So this expression is usually used at the end of a list of problems. So for example, oh, I lost my job and I don't have money to pay my rent and my family is out of town, they can't help me. I don't know what to do. So this means I don't know what the next step should be. We use this when we're like very upset and we feel like we have no options or we don't know the next thing to do. We don't know the next thing we should do. So this expresses uh, like 
very upset feelings. So maybe sadness, it could be sometimes maybe embarrassment, it could be anger maybe too or frustration, but very negative emotions here. I don't know what to do. This one is like is more like less confidence. I'm not sure I can do this. You feel anxious or uh, not confident in yourself. This one is more for like sadness. I don't know what to do. Okay, so these are these expressions for sharing your nervousness or talking about challenges and struggles. On this side of the board then is ways to talk about challenges and struggles in a positive way. So first, noun phrase was a huge challenge. Noun phrase was a huge challenge. For example, that test was a huge challenge or the marathon was a huge challenge. You'll notice in this sentence I'm using past tense. So was, not is. This means that this noun phrase is finished. It's done, it's finished. Like we're done with it. We're not working on it anymore, it's over. So that test was a huge challenge. So we're using challenge here. It sounds like it was difficult, but it was okay. We probably would not use struggle in the same way because that test was a huge struggle. Sounds more negative. Challenge sounds kind of positive. Struggle sounds more negative. So that test was a huge challenge. <laughs> that test was such a struggle. You might hear that. It sounds much less positive than challenge. Same thing with the marathon. The marathon was such a struggle. It sounds like it wasn't fun. It wasn't a good experience. Challenge sounds like it was a positive experience. Okay, let's continue to this next one. Subject has overcome many struggles. Subject has overcome many struggles. So here, subject, usually um, we'll use this expression when we're talking about another person. For example, a famous person, like an author or an artist or uh, maybe actor, actress, someone who has a famous story. And this overcome many struggles means that person had many struggles, so negative challenges in his or her life. Overcome, to overcome something means to do something in order to get past it. So I have this struggle, but maybe I work hard and I can go past my struggle. I can move forward. I can go to the next step to overcome something. So to go beyond that struggle. So we'll often use this with he or she. He has overcome many struggles or she has overcome many struggles. You could say this about yourself, I suppose. I have, in this case, we need to conjugate the verb. I have overcome many struggles. You might say that too. Uh, but you might hear this when we're, when listening to an interview with a famous person or when talking about a famous person, perhaps. Okay, let's look at the next one. Noun phrase was a struggle, but I got through it. Noun phrase was a struggle, but I got through it. So earlier I talked about how struggle has that negative feel compared to challenge. So here I'm using struggle because I want to emphasize it was negative. It was really hard. Like I was not happy about it. However, so but, and then here the mood improves, but I got through it. I got through it. So I got through it means I finished something. I was able to complete it. I was able to do it. So at native speed, I might say something like, my exam was a struggle, but I got through it. So that shows that yes, it was really hard. I didn't like it, but I finished it. So there's that balance there of down and upward feelings. Another example, getting certified was a struggle, but I got through it. So it sounds like, yes, I had this thing that I didn't like. However, I completed it. So that's a, another way that you can express like a little bit of positivity and some negativity with your word choice here. You could use challenge if you want. Like my exam was a challenge, but I got through it. So that sounds a little more positive than struggle. So the contrast here is not as strong. It's like you're sharing two things that are very similar in these parts of the sentence. But you can if you like. I feel that struggle is a little bit better of a word choice here, personally. 
Okay, last two are just a couple of ideas,、uh, a couple of maybe expressions you might hear from time to time. First, it's okay to struggle sometimes. It's okay to struggle sometimes. So this is a common idea that not everybody is perfect always. So it's very normal to struggle, to have a difficult time sometimes. So you might hear it's okay to struggle sometimes. It's okay to struggle sometimes. So don't worry. You might hear this if you express something like this or like this to a friend. You might say, "I'm not sure I can do this," or "I don't know what to do," and your friend might say, "It's okay to struggle sometimes. Like, let's look at the next step, or let's look at what we can do." The last one is a very common one.、Uh, this is used a lot. For school children, I feel challenge yourself. Challenge yourself. So that means make choices or try to do things that are a little difficult for you, but that are positive. Why? Like to help you grow, to help you move to the next step. So we say this as well, like in language learning. Like don't just do the easy thing always. It's important to challenge yourself to do the things that are a little bit difficult, so that you can grow. You can go to the next level. So challenge yourself. This is a very common expression、uh, for anyone growing and learning. So these are some expressions that you can use to talk about challenges and struggles and expressing difficulty in your life, as well as to express、uh, getting past that difficulty too. So I hope that this was helpful for you. Of course, if you know some other expressions related to this topic, or if you have any questions or comments, or if you want to practice making some sentences, please feel free to do so in the comment section of this video. Also, if you like this lesson, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to our Channel if you haven't already, and check us out at EnglishClass101.com for some other things that can help you with your English studies. Thanks very much for watching this lesson, and I will see you again soon. Bye bye. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. In this lesson, I'm going to talk about expressions you can use to decline or reject invitations. So these are expressions you can use to politely say no to something. Let's get started. Okay. On this side of the board, I want to talk about some casual expressions. These are expressions you can use with friends, with family members, with close coworkers. These are everyday expressions you can use to say no when someone invites you to something. Let's start with the first one. Thanks for the invitation, but so at native speed, this sounds like thanks for the invitation, but. You can use this in speech, and you can use this in writing. A couple of points: thanks for. We use thanks for, and we use the invitation. The invitation. So this the means your invitation this time. Thanks for the invitation, but, and after but. We include some reason. So I'm going to say no. Here's my reason. Thanks for the invitation, but I have to work that day. Thanks for the invitation, but I have to work that day. So I've used that day in my example, but you can change that day to I have to work tonight, or I have to work tomorrow, or I have to work that weekend. Whatever the time. Whatever the day of the invitation, you can change this part of the pattern. Sorry, I have to work that day. At native speed, this sounds like "Thanks for the invitation, but I have to work," or "Thanks for the invitation, but I have to work that day." Okay, the next one. I already have plans. I already have plans. Please notice here, plans is in the plural form. So not I already have a plan, but I already have plans. We use this plans to talk about something we already decided to do. I already have plans. This one is one I personally don't use a lot. Because it's not specific. If someone says, "Sorry, I already have plans," I feel like it's a lie. Like they don't want to join me. 
and they don't have a good reason not to. So they say this. I feel like this is one you can use if you really don't want to join someone and you don't have a good reason to do that,、uh, or you don't have a good reason not to join. So I don't like to use this one generally. I'll try to be specific. Like, ah,、oh, sorry, I have to work. Like, there's usually a reason I can't do something. But you may hear this, which means someone already has a plan. Of course, you can use this as well if you have, if you really do have a plan, and you just you don't want to tell the other person. It's a private plan, or there's some reason you want to keep it a secret. You can use "I already have plans." Okay. The next one is "I'm not feeling well." I'm not feeling well. So don't forget this.、Mm. I'm I'm not I not, but I'm not. I'm not feeling well. This means I'm sick. So I'm a little bit sick. That's the feeling here. I'm not feeling well. In the progressive form here, shows that this is my condition now. So at native speed, thanks for the invitation, but I'm not feeling well. So this means I'm sick. Sorry, I can't join you. And you can use good here too. You will hear native speakers say, "I'm not feeling good. I'm not feeling so good. I'm not feeling great." You can change it a little bit, but this is another common way to reject an invitation. Okay, another very useful one. This one I use a lot.、Uh, honestly, is I'm really busy with work. I'm really busy with work. Of course, you can change work to studies. I'm really busy with my studies, or I'm really busy studying for a test. Again, I'm. Don't forget this、mm、sound. I'm really busy, and you can change this. You can remove really and say, "Sorry, I'm busy with work. I can't. I'm busy with work. That's fine as well." Really is just an emphasis word. Sorry, I'm really busy with work. Also, we use this preposition here. I'm really busy with work. Or if you are at the office when you reply to this, in most cases, you can say, "I'm really busy at the office today." Or, "I'm really busy at work today." Sorry, I can't come. You may also hear that's used、uh, for places. I'm really busy at the office. Sorry, I'm really busy at school today. You can use it for places too, or you can use with plus work or studies. At native speed, it sounds like, "Thanks for the invitation, but I'm really busy with work." Okay, last one is, "I'm spending time with my family." I'm spending time with my family. So again, "I'm," "I am," plus the progressive "spending." I'm spending time. So spending time means I'm taking time or I'm using my time now to be with my family. I'm spending time with my family. So this means. I have a plan, or right now,、uh, my、uh, I am actually in the act of spending time with my family. So you can use this、uh, to mean now at the moment, or you can also use this expression to mean on that day. So on the date of the invitation, you can use this same expression too. So sorry, I'm spending time with my family on that day. So at native speed, sounds like thanks for the invitation, but I'm spending time with my family. Okay, so these are a few good examples, I think, of reasons you can give、uh, when you need to reject an invitation. Some other things you might hear at the beginning of this statement are "Sorry, I can't." Sorry, I can't. So this is common in like text messages because it's so short. This is especially common when you're talking with very close friends. Like you don't need to say "Thanks for the invitation" every time. But this is very quick and easy. Sorry, I can't. I have to work that day. So follow "Sorry, I can't" with one of these expressions or something similar. Another good one is "I would love to," but I would love to. But so this "to" is like a response to the invitation, a verb in the invitation. For example, do you want to see a new movie this weekend? So I would love to see a new movie, but we drop the rest of that、uh, expression. I would love to verb from the invitation, but I have to work that day. I already have plans. 
So I would love to. So this means this is an unreal situation. Like that sounds good. That sounds awesome. I want to do that, but I can't. So we use would here instead of will because this is unreal, a future thing that is unreal. So I would love to, but I can't. So these are casual expressions you can use with your friends. Okay, let's go to some formal expressions on this side of the board. Of course, these expressions you can use at work as well. They don't sound rude. I would suggest using this one for work invitations to sound a little bit more polite, but sometimes you have invitations that are more formal. Uh, so perhaps a business event or an academic event. Here's one example of a way to reject an invitation. I appreciate the invitation, but I am unable to attend. I appreciate the invitation, but I am unable to attend. So here, I appreciate the invitation. This is a leveled up form of thanks for the invitation. So I appreciate the invitation, but, so we have the same pattern here, just the level of formality is different. I appreciate the invitation, but I am unable. Unable means not able, I cannot do something. I am unable to attend, so to come, in other words. So this is for uh, some kind of work event, some kind of maybe academic conference, for example. I appreciate the invitation, but I'm unable to attend. You may hear a reason after this, I'm unable to attend due to something, something. I'm unable to attend due to a prior engagement or something like this. So engagement, a prior engagement means a plan I made before. So a prior, prior means before, engagement means some kind of activity, some kind of appointment. So this is a fancy way of saying, thanks for the invitation, I can't come because I have other plans. That's what this means in a formal setting. So this is quite common uh, for, again, more polite situations. I want to introduce one more here. Uh, this one is one that we use in writing. Please note we use this in writing. This is a very common way to begin a rejection letter. So this is something uh, you may see from universities in particular. If you apply for a school, you apply to enter a university, or you maybe apply for a job or something similar and you receive a rejection letter or rejection email, you may see this near the beginning of the message. So the message is, we regret to inform you that or we regret to inform you. You may see it without that. This means we are sorry to tell you. So regret means we have sad feelings about something. Like we don't want to tell you this, but we have to. We regret to inform. To inform means to give information, to tell someone something, to share someone, or to share information with someone. So we regret to inform you means we're very sorry to tell you that your application has not been accepted. Your application has not been accepted. So this could be a school application, it could be a job application or something else. Has not been accepted. You may also see simple past tense. Your application was not accepted. It just means no. Sorry, your application was not accepted or sorry, we can't accept you at this time. So this is a very common way to begin the rejection message. Again, this is something that we use in writing. We don't really use this in speech, but it's quite well known. Okay, let's look at one more way to reject an invitation. Unfortunately, I am not able to participate this time. Unfortunately, I'm not able to participate this time. Or perhaps you might hear, unfortunately, I'm not able to attend this time. So a couple points, unfortunately, shows like, ah, it's too bad. That's kind of what it means. Sorry, it's too bad. But I am not able. So again, we see this, I am not able, which is just like I am unable. Both are correct. You can choose whichever you prefer. 
I am not able to participate, to participate. So this means it could be an event, it could be some kind of activity, whatever, to participate. You might use this sometimes instead of attend, maybe if someone uh, invites you to speak at an event or something like that, you might use participate instead of just attend the event. And this part is nice to include, this time, this time. So that means for this event in particular, I'm not able to participate, sorry. But it's like in the future, maybe I can. So this time shows that, you know, you can maybe not come now, but perhaps in the future, if there's an opportunity, you might be able to join. So I like to include this time when I have to reject an invitation in a formal way. So finally, I want to end this by talking about like positive endings. So how to conclude a message or how to conclude uh, some kind of rejection message. We tend to end them with a positive feeling. So next time, this is a good one for your friends and for your family members. Sorry, I can't see a movie with you tonight, next time. So this means next time we have this chance, or I'll spend time with you next opportunity. So next time is a really quick and easy way to say, like, please invite me again, or let's find another day to get together. This is a good one for events. I hope I can come next time. I hope I can come next time. Means I hope I'm able to attend. I hope I'm able to join your event or join your party, whatever the next time it happens or the next time you do something. This one, we wish you all the best. This is another one that you will see usually in writing. This might come at the end of a rejection letter. We wish you all the best. We wish you all the best means like all the best in your life. We wish you lots and lots of good things in your life. So like we don't want you to feel upset, though this was maybe a sad letter, but we have good wishes for you. We wish you all the best. Okay, this is another good one for events, for like maybe parties or conferences that you cannot attend. I hope it's a great event. I hope it's a great event. I hope it is a great event, or I hope it's a good event, or you can change event to party or to conference or to seminar, whatever the activity is. And finally, best of luck with, best of luck with the event or best of luck with your studies. So again, this is like saying good luck. You can change good luck to best of luck, excuse me, and when we use best of luck, or good luck, we use the preposition with. Best of luck with the event, or good luck with the event, or best of luck with your studies. So this introduces, again, like some kind of well-wishing expression. Best of luck with something, or good luck with something. So these are some ways that you can reject or decline offers. So I hope that this was helpful for you. Of course, if you know any other expressions to say no to something, please feel free to share those in the comments. Of course, also, if you have any questions or comments or want to practice making sentences with these expressions, please feel free to do so in the comment section below. Also, if you like this lesson, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel if you have not already, and check us out at EnglishClass101.com for some other things that can help you with your English studies. Thanks very much for watching this lesson, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye! Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. In this lesson, I'm going to talk about prepositions that we use in common present perfect tense sentences. I'm going to talk about four prepositions and how we commonly use them. Let's get started. Okay. First, I want to practice a few examples with the preposition to, to. So we use to, one of the uses of to is to express motion or to refer to some motion happening. So we use to in present perfect tense expressions when we're talking about traveling or we're talking about movement from one place to another. So these are a few common verbs that we use to with. Of course, for today's lesson, I'm focusing on present perfect tense, but of course you can use these verbs in other tenses with this preposition too. 
So some very common examples are, I have been to place, or I have traveled to place, I have driven to place. So for this lesson, these are all the past participle forms of the verbs, but again, you can use, uh, for example, past tense or a future tense expression as well. Another key point is when you use the preposition to, you need to use a specific place name. For example, I've been to China, or I've traveled to France, or I've driven to school. So we're using a specific place name here. A common error, a common mistake that I hear among learners is that people will use the word there here, like I have been to there, that's incorrect. We need to use a specific place name here. We can't use there and a preposition. If you want to say there, just remove the preposition. I've been there. Oh, I've traveled there. I've driven there. And then it's perfect. So again, to plus a specific place or there with no preposition. Another situation where you'll use to is when you're talking about movement of like objects as well. So in this case, digital objects. We can imagine files as digital objects. For example, he has sent the files to the clients. So here again with this to, we're talking about some movement. In the first example, it was movement of people, like an actual body or bodies moving from place to place. In this example, we're talking about data or we're talking about objects moving from place to place. So with a verb like maybe send, in this case sent, the past participle form, we use to to talk about that. So the item or items in this case that is moving and the direction here. So we're marking this destination and we're showing the movement, the relationship here with to. So we use to to express motion to talk about movement. And we use to before the destination, the place where we're going, or in this case, uh, the person receiving something. Okay, so now let's go to at. The second part I want to talk about is at. We use at to mark the location of something, the place where an action occurs, the place where something happens. So there are many different verbs that we can use with at, and similar to to, we follow at with a specific location. So again, we don't say at there, we can't use that pattern. We need to use at plus a specific place name or like a city name, country name, and so on. So some examples of verbs you might use are study or see or stay. So these are verbs that aren't relating like to movement. We're not moving from one place to another and objects aren't moving from one place to another place. Rather, these verbs are talking about actions where like we as people, people remain in place or as objects, the object remains in place. There's not movement really. So when we want to express that, we put the verb uh, in this case, past participle form. And then we follow that, or we follow the verb phrase with at and connect it to the place. So for example, I have studied at ABC College. I have studied at ABC College. So I cannot use to here. I have studied to ABC College is incorrect because this verb is not indicating motion in some way. It's study. So study is the action and we're talking about the place where the action happened. So there's not, like, we're not reporting on movement or motion of any kind. Another example, we haven't seen a basketball game at the city arena. We haven't seen a basketball game at the city arena. So again, at is marking this specific location where an activity, seeing a basketball game, happens, or in this case, has not happened. So the speaker is saying, we have not had the experience of watching or seeing a basketball game at this arena. So we're marking the location with 
at. My verb is see here. Again, we're not talking about motion or movement. We're talking about staying in one place and doing something in that location. One more example. She has stayed at that hotel. She has stayed at that hotel. So my verb is stay. The past participle form is stayed. And I'm talking about that hotel, specifically that hotel. So yes, I'm using that, that's fine. In a conversation, I might say something, or the first person in this conversation might say something like, oh, hey, does she know that hotel? Or has she heard of that hotel? And the follow-up might be, yeah, she has stayed at that hotel. So a specific hotel here. Again, this is the action, staying. Staying is the action. We mark it with at. So we cannot use to here. She has stayed to that hotel is incorrect because to marks motion. Stay is not a motion. It is not a movement. We are doing it in place, in this location. So please be careful when you're choosing between at and to uh, for these kinds of expressions. Yes, we can use both prepositions before a specific place, but they have different functions. So at marks our location for something. Two is marking our motion and movement towards a location. Okay, so let's go on to the second part of this lesson. For the second part, I want to talk about for and since. Very, very commonly used with present perfect tense. First, we use for to mark time periods, time periods, so a length of time. We use for to mark this. For example, he has worked here for two years. He has worked here for two years. So the activity is working. In this case, he has worked here. And we're marking this time period, years, with for. So for shows us the length of time that something happened. So this sentence means he's still working here. Like this is an ongoing activity. This is still happening. And we want to mention how long the activity has happened. Another example, she has been sleeping for 10 hours. She has been sleeping for 10 hours. So yes, this is an example that's in the present perfect progressive form. That's fine. You can use the same rules with present perfect progressive. Again, we're marking a time period with for. You'll notice too that these are all in the plural form. So make sure it's not two year or for 10 hour, whatever. We need to make sure to pronounce clearly and write in writing this S here to make the plural form. So this is marking a time period, a length of time. One more example, we have been dating for six months. We have been dating for six months. So that means six months ago, we started dating. And since that time, I'll talk about since in just a moment, for that time period until this conversation, the dating has continued. So they have been in a relationship. So we use for to mark this kind of time. So we cannot use to, we cannot use at here. So we don't use to because we're not showing motion of some kind. We, he has worked here two, two years is incorrect. We cannot use at because we're not sharing some location of an activity. The focus here is on a period of time. So let's compare this to since, since. We use since as a preposition to mark a past point in time, to mark a past point in time. So this is a key difference with for. For marks a period of time. Since marks a past point only. So we're not marking like a duration. We're not marking a length of time. Since tells us when something started or maybe the last time something happened, depending on the sentence. So let's look at some examples. I've lived here since 2013. I've lived here since 2013. So since marks our past point in time, 2013. So that means beginning in 2013 and continuing until this conversation, I've lived here, I've lived here. So since tells us when it started in this case. Here though, let's look at a negative. We haven't seen you since high school. We haven't seen you since high school. So since comes before high school here. Now high school is not like, 
a point in time, like a year or a month or a day. No, but it marks a point like in life, high school. So we can understand high school is our point in the past here. And the action, we haven't seen you. So that means from high school until this conversation, the speakers did not see the listener in this period of time. So high school is the starting point, the conversation is the ending point, and they want to express in this period, uh, they did not meet, they did not see each other. One more example, she hasn't come to work since Monday. She hasn't come to work since Monday. So here, our specific past point is Monday. Since tells us that. And she hasn't come to work. So starting at this point in the past, starting at Monday, this person, she has not come to work. So until this conversation, so no appearance by this person. So since is marking some past point in time, for is marking a period of time, a duration of time. So we can't use these uh, interchangeably. We can't switch them up. Also, we cannot use to or at in these cases either. No location is being given. Like, yes, high school, a high school is a location. But here we're talking about a period of life that is high school, a time period of life. Uh, so we can't use at, we can't use to here. So I hope that this is helpful uh, in choosing between for and since, and I hope this is helpful in choosing between to and at. Of course, we can use other prepositions as well, but these are some very common ones, and I think good ones for learners to practice. So I hope that it was helpful for you. Of course, if you have any questions or comments, or if you want to practice making example sentences, or if you want to talk about some other prepositions, please feel free to do so in the comment section of this video. Also, please don't forget to like the video and make sure to check us out at EnglishClass101.com for more stuff to help you with your English studies and make sure to subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Thanks very much for watching this lesson and I will see you again soon. Bye bye! Hey everyone! Welcome to the Monthly Review, the monthly show on language learning. Where you discover new learning strategies, motivational tips, study tools, and resources. By the way, all the lessons and bonuses you're about to see can be downloaded for free on our website. So click the link in the description right now to sign up for your free lifetime account. Okay, today's topic is, can busy people actually learn a language? You yourself probably have an answer to this question, right? But whether you can or can't actually has a bit more to do with your mindset than anything else. And in this guide, you'll discover, one, is it possible for busy people to learn a language and the mindset needed? Two, mental bandwidth, the one thing that can make or break your language goals. And three, five mindset tricks to make time for language. But first, if you're looking for new free language resources and downloads, here are this month's new lessons and resources. Be sure to download these now before we take them down in a few days. First, the Talking Online PDF Cheat Sheet. Learn the must-know internet slang and all the internet-related vocab and phrases in your target language with this PDF Cheat Sheet. And second, the 40 Words and Phrases for Ordering Food Writing Workbook. With this free resource, you'll pick up must-know words and phrases for the restaurant and practice writing them out as well. To get your free resources, click the link in the description below right now. They're yours to keep forever. Can busy people actually learn a language? Part 1. Is it possible for busy people to learn a language and the mindset needed? So, can busy people actually learn a language? What do you think? Leave us a comment and let us know. As much as we want to say yes, it's more of a yes or no depending on the person. Why yes? Yes, because many of our members are busy and are learning with our system. And some of you who are watching also fall into this camp. But it also depends on the person because it's more of a mindset thing. Either you think you have time or you don't. For example, many of our members fall into the group of can learn and can find the time, even if they're busy. If you're busy and still want to learn, if you look around, you can always find five or 10 minutes a day, like on a commute. 
Now, if your mindset is the opposite, if you think you can't learn a language or you don't have time, you won't even try, even if you had a resource that was proven to work. Part two, mental bandwidth, the one thing that can make or break your language goals. And if you think about it, if you had all the time in the world but felt like you couldn't learn a language, you wouldn't try either. Again, this is why it comes down to the mindset and why it all depends on each individual person. Either you think you can or you think you can't. But it may not always be this black and white either. It can also depend on your mental bandwidth too. Think back to your school days, those few days before exams. It got really busy and you had to stop everything to study, right? You were probably thinking, if I can just get through studying this week and take the test, then next week I can finally start relaxing and doing other things. And if someone asked you if you wanted to hang out, you would say no, because you're busy. But chances are you still managed to spend at least 30 minutes on YouTube or social media. Meaning you did have some time, even if you were busy. But the test was occupying your mind and taking up all that bandwidth. So it's also possible that we just don't have the mental bandwidth because we're overwhelmed. And this is a genuine reason for not being able to learn when you're busy. Don't worry, in the next part, we'll show you how to get some bandwidth so that you don't feel overwhelmed. Part three, five mindset tricks to make time for language. So if you've gotten this far, you understand that it is possible to start learning a language, even if you're busy, that you can find the time, but it mostly comes down to your mindset. So how can you develop the mindset? So when you're too busy, it feels like you're overwhelmed and like you don't have control of your time. Well, there are a few things you can do to gain some control of your time, have some breathing room, and learn a bit of language. First. Always set small, measurable goals. This is something that we talk a lot about here. For example, learn for 10, 15, or 20 minutes every day. Learn 100 words in one month, which means learning three to four words a day. And the mindset behind this is just being realistic with your goals and what you can do. Because if you're busy, you may not have one or two hours. And this is a strict rule, especially when starting out with new goals and languages. Always stick to small, measurable goals. Second, lowering your goals and expectations is okay when things get super busy. If you couldn't learn all 100 words for the month and only got up to 40 or 60, that's okay. If you tried learning on Monday and Tuesday but skipped Wednesday and Thursday, that's okay. Sometimes you have to shift priorities, and prioritizing things is a secret to a successful life. You may not get to the goal you wanted to achieve today, but you can get to it next week. Third, it's okay to put language on pause if life gets in the way. Just like with that last point, you can always come back and reach your goal a little later. We often see learners put language on pause, come back later. Some even come back years later, but the key is to come back. Fourth, avoid the all or nothing mindset at all costs. And an all or nothing mindset is something you'll see in beginners and perfectionists. When you have this mindset, you'll say, language learning requires hours, so there's no point in learning for a few minutes today. But something is better than nothing, and even five to 10 minutes of review adds up in the grand scheme. And in the grand scheme, it's more important to be consistent, even if it's just for a minute a day, rather than study for hours once a week. The brain just doesn't work that way. Fifth, do you have a slowdown or relaxing routine that you do on the weekends or whenever you have free time? And if you didn't do it, you'd feel overwhelmed? Leave us a comment and let us know what it is. For some, it could be reading, watching TV, or going to a cafe and doing nothing for a bit. You're there on your own, you don't have much to do in front of you, even if it's just 10 or 15 minutes. And if you're settled, you start feeling in control. And that's the point you have some mental bandwidth. You can start doing some time management and plan your week out. You can put in a few minutes of language learning. But if you don't slow down and if you feel overwhelmed, you could have the easiest possible way to learn a language. And you still wouldn't do it. So back to you. If you were busy, do you think you'd be able to learn a language? Leave us a comment. So thank you for watching this episode of Monthly Review. Do you record yourself speaking your target language? 
If you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share the video with anyone who's trying to learn a language, and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. And if you're ready to finally learn language the fast, fun, and easy way and start speaking from your very first lesson, get our complete learning program. Sign up for your free lifetime account right now. Click the link in the description. See you next time. Bye. You say you want to learn and speak the language, but you never quite make the time for it. Well, what if we told you there's an easy way to make time and turn language learning into a habit without carving out time, rearranging your schedule, or changing your life? How to use habit stacking to learn and create a simple learning routine. Stick around. In today's guide, you'll discover one, how to use habit stacking to create a learning routine Two, how to learn language while you're on the go. Three, how to boost your vocabulary in under a minute a day. And four, how to learn while relaxing, plus more. But first, if you don't yet have access to our language learning system, sign up for a free lifetime account right now. Just click the link in the description to get your free lifetime account. What's habit stacking? Habit stacking is an easy way to create new habits by stacking a new habit that you want to have on top of an existing habit that you already have. Why do this? Well, new habits are hard to stick with, but your existing ones are already built into your brain. So by stacking or combining an existing habit with a new one, you're much more likely to stick with it. For example, if you commute to work or school in the morning, use that time to learn the language, listen to an audio lesson of ours. So here's what else you can do with our learning system. <laughs> Download the Innovative Language Learning app for the iPhone or Android, and you can play our audio and video lessons, absorb practical conversations, pick up new words, phrases, and grammar rules, all during your commute. By the way, you can also apply this tactic to any other routine where it makes sense, like on a walk or while grocery shopping. Do you tend to check your email at a certain time of the day? If so, you can also pick up new words in your target language with our Word of the Day emails. With the Word of the Day, you get new words, translations, and sample sentences, all delivered to your inbox. And all of this takes just a minute or less. This service is free for anyone who has an account with us. If you tend to wind down in the evening with TV or podcasts, you can use that time to learn some language as well. Just turn on our lessons and play them in the background. Or you can play our vocabulary slideshows and passively review vocabulary in the same way. You can access vocabulary slideshows for free inside our vocabulary lists. By the way, if you've noticed, all of these suggestions include one, your existing habit like commuting, taking a walk, checking email, or relaxing in the evening, and two, your desired habit, learning a language. So if you want to learn the language and get access to these learning tools and our learning system, sign up for a free lifetime account right now. Just click the link in the description to get your free lifetime account. If you're learning a language, the words and phrases that will come easiest to you will always be the ones you're interested in. Whether it's words with bad or funny meanings or phrases about yourself, such as where you're from or how old you are. So what if you could make your own printable vocabulary worksheets so you could review and practice writing out the words that you're interested in? How to create your own printable vocabulary worksheets. Well, stick around. In today's guide, you'll discover one, how to assemble your own word and phrase lists, two, how to create your own printable worksheets, and much more. But first, if you don't yet have access to our language learning system, sign up for a free lifetime account right now. Just click the link in the description to get your free lifetime account. While you're learning the language, you should keep in mind what exactly you want from this language. Do you want to talk about yourself, your hobbies, or understand TV or music? Why? Because you'll naturally learn faster if you're learning about what you're interested in. So here's how you can assemble your own personal vocab lists. One, 
as you go through our lessons on the pathway, you'll likely come across words and phrases you want to remember. You could write them down, or you can send them to the Word Bank, which is a premium feature where you can store words and phrases for later review. So look for the Add to Word Bank button on the lesson page. Two, you can also save words and phrases from our free vocabulary list to the Word Bank as well. You can sort through hundreds of vocabulary lists by topics such as weather, hobbies, talking about your day, and more. So you can find words that you're interested in. And then click on Add All to Word Bank. Here's how you can make your own worksheets. Just go to the vocabulary menu and select Word Bank. There, you'll see your collection of words and phrases. Just click on Printer-Friendly Version to print them out. You can also click Export Word Bank. If you've organized and labeled your words into categories, such as verbs and adjectives, you can select that label and export it as a PDF. Then, go ahead and print the file out. You can use this worksheet to review the words or even write on it. So, if you just want ready-made printable worksheets and cheat sheets, then you can always unlock our free Conversation and Vocabulary PDF Cheat Sheets and PDF Writing Worksheets. These resources are free for members of our language learning system. So, if you want to learn the language and get access to these learning tools and our learning system, sign up for a free lifetime account right now. Just click the link in the description to get your free lifetime account. Great work. Here's a reward. Speed up your language learning with our PDF lessons. Get all of our best PDF cheat sheets and eBooks for free. Just click the link in the description.